Good morning. So this is resolved, huh? I haven't been here in a while. Um, good to be back. Like, he, like Dwayne said, my name is Bobby. And uh, planting a church over in the UTC area. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It's good to see everyone. Though I can't really see you. I've got lights in my face. Okay. Uh, Dwayne's pretty bold doing this video introduction. I've never had an introduction via video before. I could pretty much say whatever I want about him right now, and he wouldn't be here to defend himself, right? So, uh, yeah, what, what should I say? Um, no, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'm just, we're really grateful to be here. Uh, there's a couple people I wanted to introduce. I didn't let them know I was going to do this, but my wife is here somewhere. Do you raise, that's, no, that's, he's not my wife. Um, but, oh, there she is. I want to say hi. This is my wife, Amy, super supportive to me. Love this woman to death. And then a lot of the Church Plenty team um, that we're working with to kind of plant this church and get it going is here as well. If you guys could just raise your hand and say hi. So if you see them, feel free to talk with them. Um, planting churches is difficult, and they're in this, the beginning processes with us, and it's a difficult process. So encourage them, pray for them, say hi to them. For the most part, they're pretty talkative, nice people. Um, but yeah, so really, we're grateful to be here, uh, grateful to come and share a message what we're doing is for the last couple of months, we've really been traveling around San Diego, visiting a bunch of different churches. Um, I'll go and I'll preach a message and uh, kind of encourage the body, hopefully, in the gospel. And uh, then we get encouraged by going and visiting new people and seeing all the work that God's doing in San Diego. Um, so it's kind of like mutually beneficial. And it really reminds me of the book of Acts. If you read through the book of Acts, you see the Apostle Paul, who is probably the most famous church planter ever kind of traveling through um, different parts of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and Asia, planting churches. But he usually got a team of people with him, and they'll arrive to some church and, uh, or some synagogue, and they'll proclaim the gospel, and he's got a crew of people, and then a church will be planted, and then he'll come back and visit and bring people, and uh, just kind of, they kind of work back and forth that way. And it really feels like that's what we're doing here lately, kind of traveling around, got a group of people with us, sharing the gospel and doing that whole thing. So. Pretty neat. Um, I wanted to say something about Dwayne, but I just can't think of anything right now because, you know, it's like my chance to harass him while he's not here to defend himself. Um, but like he was saying, the Resolve Church, uh, you guys, you do support us financially. Um, we're really appreciative of that, and hopefully you guys will be encouraged today through Luke 7. So, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke 7. We're going to look at uh, verses 36 through 50. And this is one of my favorite passages, favorite stories in the scripture. Um, we'll kind of go through it a little bit there. Let me pray for us real quick while you turn. Uh, Lord, we come before you today as your people, as your family. We're grateful that we live in a place where we can open up the Bible and we can preach and proclaim from it um, without fear. And Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us today, Lord, that you would kind of Teach us and show us that you get our hearts ready to hear from you. And um, we trust that you will do this. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So uh, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's Luke 7. And this is really one of the hallmarks of the Christian faith. Um, the gospel is clearly laid forth um, in this text. It talks about a God who initiates with us. Uh, if you remember, God actually sent his son Jesus into the world to reach us with this message that he's done what we couldn't do, he's lived the life that we couldn't live, he's accomplished what we couldn't accomplish on our own. And so you have Jesus kind of coming to the world, um, you have him given this radical, crazy message of love and forgiveness, and um, that's so clearly in the text that we're going to read today. And, um, but also, like, this is a great story, too. And one of the things I think that we love about stories in our culture, and really all cultures, is that we can connect with them. Um, the, the villains are in the story, you know, hopefully you don't connect with too much, but sometimes we, their pain, we know the heroes in the story, their successes we get to be a part of. Um, so the ups and the downs, we kind of move through when we watch movies or whatever, we kind of get to experience that with the characters in the story. And so this is a really good story, and there's a couple characters in it. You have Jesus, you have a woman who's a prostitute, and then you have a Pharisee, um, a religious person. 
And uh, they each have their own issues. And we're going to see in the text how Jesus addresses both of them where they are and really offers what they need. And so as we're kind of going through this text today, from the beginning, I want to just kind of challenge you all as you're here to engage in the story a little bit. I'm going to talk about some of the cultural things. We're going to go through the text um, kind of verse by verse. But really engage in the story and think about where do you fit in and what is God trying to say to you this morning? Do you identify with the woman who's a prostitute? Um, Have you lived a life that's just been rebellious to God and maybe you think you've done things that kind of put you out of reach of His grace? Or maybe on the other end of the spectrum, you're kind of that religious person. You've been born and raised in a religious family. You've memorized Bible verses. You're the champion sword drill person in Awana or whatever those camps are. I wasn't raised a Christian. Um, You know, but maybe you're that religious person and, and you actually think to some degree you've actually attained some level of um, presentability before God. So rather than trusting in Jesus, you're trusting in some sense of your own works. You've kind of minimized the law of God maybe a little bit and think that it's something that's attainable for you. Um, and so I just kind of want to challenge you to identify. I know in my life I've identified with both of these characters. Sometimes I'm outright rebellious and sometimes I'm just a religious idiot. And we kind of ping pong back and forth through life in these two, these two areas. And so I just want to give you a moment to think about your week, think about where you're at, think about what God has brought you through, and maybe identify with, with this story today. I'm praying, my prayer has been that the Spirit of God would literally, you'd have an encounter with Him. And you'd be challenged, and hopefully your heart strings are going to be tugged on, um, and you're going to fall more in love with this glorious God that we call Jesus. So, definitely the prayer. Uh, let me pray for us again. Father, just thanks for this morning. Uh, we ask that you would go before us and do this work. Um, literally right now as we're thinking about our week and we're thinking about the things that we've gone through, would you, um, would you reveal yourself to us? And would you bring us into the presence of the living God and would we be challenged? And uh, will we know you better? In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I noticed in the bulletin that you guys have these handouts here. And on one of them it says, uh, the Resolved School of Theology. So anything that I mess up today theologically, you can get corrected right here. I think that's free. So uh, good luck to you there. Um, and how about the worship team, huh? Ooh, good stuff. Brought me back to my Bama roots. from Alabama, so I was bluegrassing it up over there. Uh, my cousin, she's from Bama here too. I'm sure she was like, you know, doing her thing. I don't know. Sorry, Tay. All right, Luke 7. Let's get to the text. Luke 7. I'm going to read through it real quick, and, uh, and then we'll kind of jump into it. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, Luke 7. One of the Pharisees asked him, that's Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then Jesus, turning toward the woman, said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven then, go, then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, 
who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So here's our story today. Uh, beautiful story. Again, there's a prostitute. There's a woman involved in the story. Um, crazy, crazy acts of love towards Jesus. And there's a, Simon, uh, a Pharisee named Simon, um, kind of a jerk in the story. And then, of course, there's Jesus, uh, the one who really it's all about. Um, so there's a couple things. The first one in verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he took his place at the table. Now, from the very beginning of this text, um, we got to notice a couple things. One is that Jesus was invited to this dinner party. Now, I don't know about you, but Jesus got invited to dinner parties all the time. Um, right before this, it talks about how Jesus came both drinking and eating, and they called him a glutton and a drunkard. So I, are you guys getting invited to your neighbors and your friends' parties and people who don't know Jesus? Um, just kind of curious here. I want to throw it out there. We should be getting invited to parties because Jesus was invited to parties. Now, you might not like the logic there, and we can get into the details later, but just something to think about. He was invited to parties. And um, so there's a couple things, though, right off the bat with this party that he went to that was pretty rude and messed up. Um, right from the beginning, there's tons of like tenseness, and there's lots of drama happening right from the beginning. Uh, he alludes to it later on in the story, but there's three things culturally that should have happened as Jesus went to this party. The first one is, he should have been greeted with a kiss. So now Jesus at this point is a little bit of the way into his ministry. He's kind of a known rabbi, a known teacher. He's pretty respected. Um, and the Pharisee invited him over for that reason. He wants to kind of dig into Jesus a little bit more, find out what's going on, and see if they can maybe correct a couple things with this guy named Jesus, who's an up-and-coming rabbi teacher guy. But um, publicly, they humiliate him. Because culturally, when he walks into the room, he should have gotten, he should have been greeted with a kiss. But Jesus um, doesn't get one. Now, if Jesus were a respected teacher and rabbi, like he is, uh, the, the, the host of the house would have went and greeted Jesus with a kiss on the hand. He'd have kind of knelt down a little bit, kissed him on the hand, and just kind of as a sign of respect. Um, if he was just like a friend, they would have walked up and just, you know, get the little, the little peck on the side of the cheeks, you know? Like, hey, this is friendly. We know each other. We're tight. Um, Jesus gets no kiss on the hand. He gets no kiss on the cheek. So this Pharisee named Simon is literally making a statement by this. It would kind of be like if I invited you over to my house for, uh, you guys know football's coming up next week, right? What? <laughs> Am I the only one who watches football here? What's going on? Football starts next week, right? Okay. Jeez, is there a pulse in here? Okay. So football's next week. It would be like if I invited you over to the game and you like, the door was open and you walked into my house and I didn't like say hi to you, I didn't acknowledge you, I didn't wake up or, you know, get up, give you a high five, shake your hand, whatever, I didn't offer you a drink. That would be rude, right? You come into my house and I don't even acknowledge you, I'm just sitting here flipping through the channels. Like that's rude, right? Hope, maybe that's why you guys don't get invited to dinner parties, huh? You guys are rude out here, sheesh. So anyway, that's what you're supposed to do if you didn't know when someone comes over. You greet them, you say hello, you say what's up, you're, you're friendly. So Jesus walks through and he gets no kiss. But it doesn't stop there. Because the next thing that they would do culturally is that they would um, give him a little bit of water. Now, I don't know if you've walked through Jerusalem uh, 2,000 years ago. I'm guessing you haven't. Uh, it was a dirty place. The streets were dirty. They didn't have Nikes and they didn't have paved roads. So literally there's camels and horses and goats and sheep all over the place doing their business all over the place. And people walked through and they had sandals on. So before you would sit down and eat a meal you would give someone some water to kind of wash up a little bit. Makes sense, right? Nothing too crazy there. So again, the host of the house, if he was a good host, and Jesus was a respected rabbi, which he is, the host himself would get down and wash Jesus' feet for him. Simon, being the guy that he is, doesn't do it. Um, again, trying to publicly humiliate Jesus, doesn't do it. Now, if he was a well-to-do person, which Simon was a religious Pharisee, so we're assuming he did have a little bit of dolo in the pocket. 
um, he would have had his servant come and wash Jesus' feet. But he doesn't do that either. Instead, Simon doesn't do it, his servant doesn't do it, and he doesn't even give Jesus water to wash his own feet. Are you guys tracking with me here? He's, he, they are making a public statement and trying to humiliate Jesus. They're trying to show, hey, we don't respect you. We don't think you're this great teacher. And we actually want to correct you on a couple things. Later on in a couple verses, he talks about if this man were really a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is. So you can see they're trying to correct Jesus and really they're messing with him. They're publicly humiliating him. Last but not least is the oil. Uh, when, you, when you go into someone's house at this time, uh, it's the desert. Again, I don't know if you've been to this area of the world, but it's hot, kind of like El Cajon. If you're from there, hopefully you put some oil on this morning, you know what I mean? Uh, so anyway, they, you would give someone some oil just to kind of, you know, put on your head, maybe a little here, a little there to help freshen up a little bit. It was just polite. Um, it's a hot, sweaty culture, and Jesus gets no oil. So, from the beginning, this is a very tense dinner party. He was invited. He didn't just show up to this guy's party. It says in 36, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And so he went into the Pharisee's house, and he took his place at the table. So there's kind of setting the scene for you a little bit. And again, some of the reason that I want to do this is because I really want to, I want to usher you into the story. I want you guys to see and feel and think like, if I'm there and I'm with Jesus, what is he saying to me? What does he want to say to you this morning? Where are you at with this person that the story is all about this morning named Jesus? Think about your week. Think about what you've gone through. I've had a very difficult week. Um, <clears throat> so I want to kind of usher us in here a little bit. Verse 37. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. So, she's not invited to this party. She's a, as it says in 37, a woman of the city, a sinner. She's a prostitute. She's not invited to the party. She shows up anyway, and she reclines at the table. Now, I want to just kind of pause here and slow down a little bit and think about and kind of identify with this woman a little bit. Um, one author writes that nobody grows up aspiring to be a prostitute. Safe to say. Uh, all of you here, when you were children, you never were like, you know what, when I grow up, I think that's what I'm going to do. That didn't happen. Let me give you a couple ways that this is that someone could wind up being a prostitute in this time. Very common ways. Again, she probably didn't, this probably wasn't her goal in life. She probably didn't set out to be that. And so, a common way is that maybe her husband had rejected her, and this is all that she could do now. This is a different culture and a different time. This is thousands of years ago. And if her husband had rejected her, this might be all that she can do to live and survive and eat. And so and I think it's probably not too far to say, even if she, her husband hadn't rejected her, she knows the pain of rejection. How many of us today have walked through the doors knowing about rejection? Knowing what it feels like to be rejected by people. Maybe sometimes today we don't just outright reject people, but we just kind of, arrogantly or rudely tolerate. You know what? Maybe she wasn't rejected by her husband. Maybe, maybe just somewhere along the road of life, her heart got hard. How many of us are here today, walking through those doors right back there, had our seat, sat during worship, and our hearts are just hard in some areas towards God. Just hard. Another common way is war. Um, people became prostitutes through war. They were captured and they were forced into this. Sometimes they were abandoned as babies. Parents couldn't, couldn't afford it or couldn't handle it or for whatever reason they would just abandon them. And so 
you know, prostitution and slave trade uh, would take them up. Sometimes parents would sell children into slavery for money. The point is, is we don't really know how she wound up here. But before we're so quick to judge and condemn this woman, let's maybe at least entertain the idea that she probably didn't set out to do this. And she knows the pain of rejection, probably abandonment. Um, it is not a far stretch to say that she knows isolation and loneliness in these things. One thing is for sure in this society, no decent person will welcome her, speak to her, or even acknowledge her. I'm going to say that again. In this society and at this time, no decent person will welcome her, speak to her, or acknowledge her. Now, if Again, this isn't too far stretched from our settings today. If you walk down El Cajon Boulevard or various parts of downtown and you have your kids with you and you see a prostitute on the street, you might likely cross over to the other side of the street so you don't have to walk by. So we can, we can identify this with a little bit. We know what that's like. And, and in some sense, we don't want to acknowledge these things in our society either. But uh, uh, one guy writes that the only time that doors open for this woman are at night and in secret and in shame. Let me read verse 37 to you again. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Her religious society has been clear to her that she has done too much and sinned too greatly to know and experience the forgiveness and love of our Father God. She's gone too far and done too much. And then, all of a sudden, maybe for the first time in a long time, she gets a glimmer of hope. Because she came into this rabbi Named Jesus. And maybe for the first time she gets this sense of hope that she could actually be loved by this Father God in heaven. Maybe for the first time in a long time she's been given dignity and worth. Maybe she's realized that she's not just a prostitute, a sinner, a woman of the city, but she is a cherished and beloved daughter of the King. And so all of this comes from Jesus. And so she shows up to this dinner party uninvited because she's had contact with this man named Jesus who has changed her whole life, given her hope where she was hopeless. The story doesn't make any sense unless we realize that she's come in contact with God in flesh, Jesus. Let's look at verse 38. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, what in the world just happened? Did you guys follow me with that? In verse 36, Jesus is invited to a party and he goes. In verse 37, a woman shows up to a party. And then all of a sudden in verse 38, you have this woman crying all over the place, drying his feet with her hair and anointing them with ointment. Did we miss something? Like, what happened? Does it... And again, it only makes sense if we realize that she has come across Jesus somewhere and heard his message of hope. And in fact, what's really going on is that Jesus showed up to this party He's been publicly humiliated by this guy. And she is like, how dare you? How dare you do that to Jesus? Do you know who he is? He has changed my whole life. I have hope now because of him. How dare you treat Jesus this way? And she loses it. Now what's common is in this day, dinner parties would kind of be held outside on a patio in front of this guy's house at a long table so that a lot of people could sit around it 
Um, they didn't have chairs. They'd probably be sitting on pillows. And outside of this patio area at this table called a triclinium, outside of that would be a little, a little maybe knee-to-waist-high wall. And what would happen is as um, dinner parties like this were thrown, the surrounding community would come and watch and hear and listen to the rabbis and the teachers discuss life and theology and practice in God. And so the woman shows up when she hears that he's at this party and all of a sudden sees how he's publicly humiliated, not just with the guests of the party, but with the onlooking community. And I mean, I don't know if she like hops the wall and jumps in, you know, but she literally at some point runs over to Jesus. So she interrupts a dinner party that she wasn't invited to as a known sinner and prostitute and starts crying all over the place. Like this is a radical scene. This is crazy. She could be killed for this. So she hops the wall. She starts crying all over Jesus' feet. And again, the only thing that makes sense is that she's been given hope. Maybe for the first time in a long time. One author writes that this woman who's a known prostitute walks into a party that she wasn't invited to and she gets down by Jesus' feet. Who knows how long she was there? And you just got to think at some point, while she's down at his feet, she's got to look up at him. I mean, this prostitute, this sinner, this woman of the city, at some point she had to make eye contact with Jesus as she's down by his feet. And he writes about how probably for the first time in a long time, when she looked up and made eye contact with another human being, she didn't see condemnation or lust. But she saw forgiveness and grace. Again, I I want us to come in. I want you guys to engage in the story. Allow the Spirit to work in your hearts because He wants to talk to you today uh, with your story and what you're going through and maybe the the rejection that you have felt and the places where your heart has gotten hard and have an encounter like this woman with Jesus. If you read through the Gospels, Um, the first couple books in the New Testament. One of the most commonly attributed phrases to Jesus is that he saw the crowds or he saw the multitudes or he saw the people and he felt compassion. If you just read through the first couple books in the Bible, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see this phrase attributed to Jesus over and over and over again. He saw them and he felt felt compassion. And you just got to think, this woman at his feet, weeping, she had to make eye contact with him. And she felt that compassion. So she loses it. She's crying so profusely and so hard over his feet that she can literally wet them with her tears. And wash them with her tears. I mean, she's undone by the grace and the person and the work of Jesus. And when is the last time that we've been undone with the grace and mercy of God? Where we're just so captivated, so in love with, so in by God that we would just weep like this. I pray that, I hope this morning that God is at work. And then she does something even crazier. It says in verse 38, she wept over his feet and she wiped uh, his feet with the hair of her head. Now there's a, this is significant. This is so significant. Um, in this culture and in this time, letting down your hair 
in front of, um, or just in public, if you were a woman, you could not let down your hair. Um, you, you find in some second century rabbinical teaching, I feel so funny saying that because like I've read second century rabbinical teaching, but I've read guys who've read that. So they talk about though, if you let your hair down in public, it's on the same list as bathing with men. And both are grounds for divorce. So just imagine you're out at UTC Mall doing your shop thing. And uh, you, you can't let your hair down in public. If you did, your husband could divorce you. Because it was too provocative. It was, it's a, again, this is a cultural thing. Um, but literally, if you did that, you could be stoned and killed. And so this woman shows up to a dinner party that she's not invited to. She jumps the fence. She cries all over Jesus' feet. And then she lets down her hair in front of all of these men, in front of all of these religious people, and in front of the town that's watching. And it's like she's making a statement and she's saying to Jesus and in front of all these people, I will never do this again for another man besides you. You are it for me. I am committing myself to you, to walk with you and to do whatever you want because I am yours, God. I mean, this is a radical act that she would let down her hair in public. It's crazy. She could be killed for this. And it's just this reckless abandon. Ah, I'm, she just lets down her hair in front of him. So it's, that's ridiculous. Am I the only one who thinks that's crazy? Are you guys with me? Thank you. That is insane. She could literally die. So in verse 39 and 40, it says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him. For she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Now, notice the difference between how Simon sees the woman and how Jesus sees the woman. Simon's response after this whole scene goes by is, if, he, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Why would he ever let her touch him? But you see, Jesus doesn't see her that way. Instead, like I'm trying to describe, he sees her as a forgiven daughter of the king. Someone that he came to die for. Someone that he loves immensely. And you just see this contrast between how Simon sees the woman and how Jesus sees the woman. And I don't know what our views of God are here today. I would challenge you that the version of you that Christ died for is the prostitute version of you. Not, you know, the khakis and button-up shirt, the pretty polished version that we come to on Sundays. No, no, no. No. Christ came for you when you were rebellious and the prostitute version of yourself. That is who he loves. That is who he came for. That is who he died for. And I think so often in Christianity, we just miss that. Because a lot of times, we're like the Pharisee. We're like those religious people. I just want to encourage us and remind us that this this is who God came for. The sick, the healthy don't need a doctor. So Jesus' response in verse 41. Um, again, what he should have done and what the Pharisees were expecting him to do was have the servant who wouldn't wash his feet or anoint him with oil or kiss him or whatever, um, he, would, he should have had, had Simon, come have your servant, take this woman away and get rid of her. 
How dare she come into this party and interrupt us like this? That's what Jesus' response should have been. That's probably what the Pharisees were expecting him to do, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he tells a parable or a story. In verse 41, he says, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. He canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Now here's the the whole point of of the text. the, The parable unlocks it for us. And we have to notice the order. So often we live our Christian lives and we serve on Sundays and we give our money and we um, park cars or we, we're usher greeters or we're set up and tear down or we do AV or we work in kids ministry or we read our Bibles or we pray on a regular basis. We write in our journals. We have our devos. We strive for obedience. We cast out the world and we do all of this Christian stuff to earn the approval and favor of God. And so often when we read this story, what we say over and over and over again is, did you see the woman? Man, I want to love like this woman loves. And we go, I want to be like her. I want to love like she loves. I want to sacrifice like she sacrificed. And we're like, oh my God. The, oh, I, I just wish I could love like that. Is anybody here going, man, her acts of love and devotion are crazy? So often we read the text and we we make her the hero. But do you know what would happen if you could actually have a conversation with the woman? She would never in a million years go, you need to love like I love. You need to serve like I serve. You need to give like I give. You need to be like me. You know what she would say? She wouldn't say any of that ever in a million years. She would say, do you know the Savior? Have you come in contact with Jesus? Have you experienced the love and the forgiveness of God through Jesus? She would say, look at Jesus. This man changed my whole life. I was hopeless and he gave me hope. I was unforgivable and he forgave me. She would take all of that and say, Look at Jesus. And so often, we as his kids, as God's kids, are so busy trying to be like the woman. We're so busy trying to work, and we're so busy trying to memorize the Bible, and we're so busy trying to serve, and we're so busy trying to make disciples that we miss the living God who came in flesh to forgive us all of our trespasses and sins. And today, we want to lift up him and let you see, let us see him clearly because it's him that we need. Amen. I told you this was one of my favorite stories. And then the order is important too. First, She is forgiven, and then she loves. Read the parable again. Certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one will love him more? Are you seeing what Jesus is setting up? He's saying, Simon, do you see yourself in the story? Do you see this woman in the story? He's setting it up. He's making Simon see what he's doing. So, the thrust of today is not love better, love more, do better, try harder. The message today is recognize the depth of your forgiveness. That's why I want to encourage you at the beginning to just put your week on display before God. 
Because if he can handle this woman, and he can handle every other character in the Bible, he can handle our weeks and what we've gone through. And it's when you come in contact with the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy and the love of God that you will begin to love like this woman. But first comes forgiveness. It's not struggle, strive, try harder. It's recognize the depth of your forgiveness. And verse 44 is one of the most epic scenes in the Bible. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Now, here we are again. Picture the setting. This woman has wept over Jesus' feet. She's washed it with her tears, dried it with her hair, and anointed his feet with oil. And so she's at his feet. Like this really happened. She's at his feet. And then it says that Jesus turns to the woman, but he says to Simon. So Simon's probably at the table somewhere, and he's talking to Simon, but he turns his back to him, and he looks at the woman. And it's like Jesus is just giving her so much value and so much worth. And he's drawing all of the attention in the room to see what he's done. And that if you would get the forgiveness of God, the results would look like this. If we would recognize the depth of our forgiveness, recognize the depth of his grace, his mercy, his love, this is what you get. A life that looks like this. And it says, then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. How do we know? For she loved much. What does he say right after that? But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Notice the order. It's first Forgiveness, and then love. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Just in case you weren't clear, talking to the Pharisees, he announces before all of them, he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so, what I want us to get from this story more than anything, when I say that this is like the hallmark of the Christian faith, the pinnacle of the teachings of Jesus, and so many of these stories just reflect different aspects of what God is getting across here. It's that God initiates and that God came to us and that God loves us, and that God forgives us, and our lives are not struggle and striving to please Him. That in Christ, He's pleased with us. And it's first comes forgiveness, and then comes love. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I want to love like this woman. I want my life to look more like her life. The encouragement the direction of the text, what God is saying to us today is recognize the depth of your forgiveness. One of my favorite authors writes that no one is so bad that they're beyond the reach of God's grace. None of us in this room are so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace. And none of us are so darn good that we're beyond the need of God's grace. 
And so I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And as we kind of close out the service here, I just want to pray for us that we would literally take our lives and we would just put them on display before God this morning. So no matter what you've done and how bad you think you may be, I want to encourage you that the prostitute version of you is who God came to save. On the flip side, if you're identifying today more with the Pharisee and you think you're not that bad, I want you to see that you, like Simon in the story, desperately need a Savior. If you're looking at your life today and it looks more like the woman, praise God that you are going to come forward, take the bread and the wine, which represents his body, which was crushed and broken for your forgiveness and his blood that was spilt for the forgiveness of our sins and rejoice. And if you're like the Pharisee, Simon, and you're realizing that you've been a Christian for a long time and you've been thinking that you just aren't that bad, I think the story is talking to those of us who identify with that too and saying, no, 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 no. You see, the prostitute walked away forgiven. Simon the Pharisee did not. And so if you're religious here today, and I mean that in the worst sense of the word, I want to invite you to calm down and confess your religiosity to the fact that you think you need or you don't need God. Come forward and take the elements, take the bread, take the wine or juice, and be reminded that Jesus has come to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this morning that we have a God who came, a God who is present, a God who forgives and loves. God, I ask that your spirit would be at work in us this morning and that we would confidently approach the throne of grace that we would know that the bread we take this morning represents a crushed body of your son that was broken for us. And that we would take the wine and we would recognize that our sins are forgiven, all of them past, present, and future. And that we would rejoice in a Savior like this woman. So we thank you in Jesus' name.